Hello everyone and welcome. Today we're going to be talking about Omnath, Locus of Mana. I'm Goofy Word, and let's get to the deck tech. First off, who is Omnath? Omnath is a 3 mana 1-1 one, one legendary creature, elemental, and he says that green mana doesn't empty from your mana pool as steps and phases end, and Omnath, Locus of Mana gets plus 1, plus 1 for each green mana in your mana pool. Why would you want to play Omnath? Some of the reasons that you would want to play Omnath are that you love green. You really enjoy playing a monocolored deck, and green has some big creatures. So, you don't want to play combo probably, and you don't want to play spell slinger, so you're going to play Omnath. You would like to have access to 100 plus green mana. Omnath is going to allow you to retain your mana from turn to turn, so all of a sudden having 4 lands might mean that you have 12 mana in your mana pool, and you're going to cast some enormous creature, even though your opponents are not expecting it. You also probably are not going to be afraid about drawing attention to yourself at the table. Omnath is a big, flashy commander who gets out of hand very, very quickly. So if you're playing Omnath, you have to know that there are probably going to be players that want to make you dead. This is a deck that can definitely go off early. If you get Omnath onto the battlefield after a couple of turns, you're going to just start pooling green mana, and within two or three turn cycles, you could have 30 mana in your mana pool and be casting game-winning spells. It's also a deck that's very good at going to the late game. You're going to draw a lot of cards throughout the game, and it's very likely that after a board wipe, you're going to be able to rebuild very quickly because of some of the cards we'll talk about in a little bit. Of course, Omnath is not for everyone. You might want to play Combo or Spell Slinger, as I mentioned earlier. Omnath is very hard to make work in those kinds of styles. You don't want to play Omnath if you want to stay out of the red zone. There's a lot of combat in Omnath. Often you're just making a gigantic creature and turning it sideways, but still, you are kind of vulnerable and you are going to have to win the game by actually attacking. If you want to fly under the radar at the table, like I said earlier, Omnath is not the commander for you. When you have a 37-37 commander with Trample and Shroud, you probably are going to be, you know, getting a lot of attention. If you find land-based ramp boring, Omnath is also probably not for you, because a lot of this deck relies on getting many forests onto the battlefield very quickly and using that to parlay a, a victory. If you play in a playgroup that has a lot of mass land destruction, it's going to be very hard to rebuild. You have a lot of ramp, but often that ramp is built on playing many lands quickly, and if you find that that initial push of lands isn't fruitful or they're destroyed, you might end up on the back foot and it'll be very hard to recover. So in this video, I'm going to go over the lands that are really important to play and the land tutors that kind of make this deck tick. Then we're going to talk about ramp and the mana doublers that allow Omnath to be so explosive. Then we'll talk about protecting Omnath so that you don't end up with this big thing that just dies every single turn. We'll talk about card draw so you can keep churning through your deck. We'll talk about recursion to get back the important combo pieces and the finishers, how you'll actually win the game. And then additions and replacements. We'll look at a couple cards that would fit in really well and maybe some things that should be cut, but I'll leave that up to you. Let's start by looking at the lands in this deck and the different land tutors you'll use to fetch them. This deck is very mana intensive, but it's also very colored mana intensive. You need a lot of green mana, and for that reason, you're not going to be playing a lot of non-basic lands. I play 30 basic forests and only 4 non-basics, and the reason for that is you want to be keeping as many green mana in your mana pool as possible. So there are four utility lands that I play, and a big part of this deck, and the reason that there are so many land tutors, is that you need to find key pieces, especially one in particular, pretty early. The elephant in the room is, of course, Gaia's Cradle. I do not have a copy of Gaia's Cradle. Apparently it's over $500 right now, so if you already have it, it is on the reserve list. So if you already have it, definitely play it. It's great in this deck, but I have had a lot of success with this deck without it, so I wouldn't worry too much if you are not one of the people that are lucky enough to have a cradle. That's just uh, most of us at this point. Let's look at the key lands. Like I said, I only play four. One of them is Rogue's Passage. Now the reason Rogue's Passage is so great is Omnath doesn't have Trample, and there are ways to give him Trample in the deck, but Rogue's Passage is just a very quick way to end a game 
when you're down to one opponent and you know that you're clear to get in there, you're just going to tap four plus it, so five mana really to win the game, and that's a very, very cheap price, especially considering when you have so much mana in your mana pool, that five doesn't really even feel like a big investment. Next, we have Mosswort Bridge. The great thing about Mosswort Bridge is it's extremely easy to hit the uh, hideaway requirement to play that exiled card. So it says that you're going to hide one of the top four cards when you play it, and then you can pay a green and tap it to play the exiled card if you have creatures with total power 10 or greater. Omnath by itself is very frequently going to hit that requirement, so it's a really nice way to find a key spell and hide it away and be able to cast it at instant speed later. Yavamaya Hollow is a great way to keep Omnath alive. It's got tap for one, or you can pay a green and tap it to regenerate target creature. Oftentimes, Omnath, as I've said, is going to draw a lot of hate and is going to be the target of some removal spells, and there are always going to be board wipes while Omnath's on the board. You're going to want to use Yavamaya Hollow pretty much every turn cycle. Someone's going to try to kill it in some way, and often having multiple ways to protect Omnath is key. The most important land in the deck by far is Nykthos, Shrine to Nyx, and the price on Nykthos has been going up recently, but it's definitely a worthwhile investment for this deck. So much of your mana comes from having a nice devotion to green and then just being able to tap it for six, seven, that's on the conservative side, mana at a time. And there are a couple of ways to untap lands in the deck, so often, if things are going really smoothly, your Nykthos is netting you 20 mana per turn cycle, it's a very valuable card. Let's look at the land tutors that are going to help us get those lands into play as quickly as possible. Each of these cards has advantages in its own rights, so first we're going to start with Sylvan Scrying. Sylvan Scrying is one in a green for search your library for a sorcery, search your library for a land card, reveal it, and put it in your hand, then shuffle your library. This is almost always going to get Nykthos, but occasionally you do need it to go get Yavimaya Hollow, because protecting Omnath is that important, or maybe you just drew Nykthos on your own, and that's great too. At two mana, it's very inexpensive, but this is all it does. Some of these other cards you'll see have other effects, so the land tutoring is kind of just a bit of its value. Peer's Whim is the next card I want to talk about. It's three and a green for a sorcery that says for each player, choose friend or foe. Each friend searches their library for a land card, puts it onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffles their library. Each foe sacrifices an artifact or an enchantment they control. The reason this is really powerful is early in the game you can use it to curry favor with your opponents by naming them as friends. This card came out in Battle Bond where there was a team mechanic going on, but in Commander it can be extremely nice to maybe just call the one person with a very valuable or high impact enchantment out a foe and give the other players a reason to like you and want to keep you around. Of course, you're pretty much always going to get Nykthos, and they're not going to like you for long, but any way you can kind of curry favor for a little bit is worthwhile. Uvenwald Hydra is another great creature because it is both a threat and a way to, to tutor Nykthos out of your graveyard, or out of your deck. You're almost always going to get it. It's a 6 mana, 4 and 2 greens, reach, star, star, and it's got... Uvenwald's Hydra's power and toughness are each equal to the number of lands you control, and when Uvenwald Hydra enters the battlefield, you may search your library for a land card, put it onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle your library. And again, the reason that Piers Wim and Uvenwald Hydra and this next one are so valuable is that they don't say basic land, so you're really using them to tutor out the, the utility lands that we talked about. Realm Seekers is the last land tutor I want to talk about. It is also four and green green, so six mana, and it says Realm Seekers enters the battlefield with X one plus one plus one counters on it, where X is the total number of cards in all players' hands. And you can pay two and a green and remove a plus one plus one counter from Realm Seekers to search your library for a land card, reveal it, put it in your hand, and shuffle your library. The downside here is that Realm Seekers is going to put it in your hand and not onto the battlefield, but that actually can be an upside. If you untap on your turn, play a Realm Seekers, get Nykthos, and put it into play as your land drop for the turn, you're actually in a good spot compared to Uvenwald Hydra, which puts it directly onto the battlefield, but it puts it onto the battlefield tapped, so you're not going to get advantage. take advantage of the Nykthos mana that turn. Realm Seekers is also an extremely efficient body. Often when you play it, it's going to be a 9-9, a 10-10, and it doesn't have any other keywords, but the fact that you can kind of use it similarly to a Fertilid is kind of a nice feature. 
Next, we're going to talk about the ramp and specifically the mana doublers that make Omnath really sing. The reason that this deck is so efficient and can win games is that you're going to be getting a ton of green mana, and tapping your lands once per turn cycle for mana is good and all, but there are a number of mana doublers that are going to make your lands much more efficient. Land-based ramp is the best kind because it's consistent, it's typically harder to interact with, and you're just going to get the most consistent value from it. By the time the game is in the late phases, you're going to be seeing exponential gains on the amount of mana in your mana pool thanks to a number of these mana doublers. Let's look at the actual payoffs here. Caged Sun. This is a six mana artifact, and when it enters the battlefield, you're going to choose a color. In this case, you're going to choose green, and then your green creatures get plus one, plus one. Whenever a land's ability causes you to add one or more mana of the chosen color, add one additional mana of that color. You're going to come in, say green, and all of your forests are now tapping for two green mana. Regal Behemoth. This is four green green for a 5-5 five, five creature lizard. It is, it's got trample, and when Regal Behemoth enters the battlefield, you become the monarch. When you tap a land for mana while you're the monarch, add one mana of any color to your mana pool. You're always going to be adding extra green. Now, the benefit of Regal Behemoth over Caged Sun is the monarchy is going to mean you're drawing cards as well. And the downside of Regal Behemoth is when you lose the monarchy, you're not going to be getting the mana doubling effect any longer. It is also a 5-5 with Trample, so, you know, it has that going for it. Seedborn Muse is an extremely potent mana doubler because it actually can allow your lands to tap three or four times depending on how many players are in your game. It's three green green for a 2-4 spirit, and it says untap all permanents you control during each other player's untap step. At the very worst, this means that you are in a one-on-one -on -one game and you get to tap all of your lands an extra time on your opponent's turn. In the best case scenario, you're going to be getting four times the value from your lands when you untap during each player's untap step, and that's a lot of mana for Omnath. So being able to grow Omnath by the number of lands you control every single turn is huge. As well, it says all permanents, so if you have something like a Voyaging Seder that's untapping your Nykthos, you get to use your Nykthos even more times, so you're really going to be rolling in mana at that point. Next, we'll look at Vorinclex, Voice of Hunger, which is 6 and green green for a 7-6 trample. It says, whenever you tap a land for mana, add one mana to your mana pool of any type that land produced. It also says, when an opponent taps a land for mana, that land doesn't untap during his controller's next untap step. This is both a tax and a mana doubler. So all of these mana doublers have their own benefits and their own small you know, not so strong parts. Caged Sun being an artifact is easier to kill. Regal Behemoth and Seedborn Muse and Vorinclex are all creatures, so they will die to removal. Vorinclex is very good at taxing your opponents. Seedborn Muse is potentially the most potent. Regal Behemoth gives you card draw. They all have the reasons that they fit into the deck. Zendikar Resurgent is a 7 mana enchantment version, and it says whenever you tap a land for mana, add 1 mana to your mana pool of any type that land produced. It also says whenever you cast a creature spell, draw a card. So it, along with Regal Behemoth, are giving you card draw and going to add 1 additional mana every time you tap your lands, Seaborn Muse being a bit of an exception there. There are a few more mana doublers to talk about that don't fit into this general pattern. I think these are the best, although Seedborn Muse is definitely right up there. The first I would want to talk about is Doubling Cube. Doubling Cube is a two mana artifact, and it says three, tap, double the amount of each type of mana in your mana pool. The downside of Doubling Cube is it is very slow to get going. Compared to the others, this card does nothing. But once you have some of the other doublers, or you have a nice store of mana in your mana pool just from having Omnath on the battlefield for a couple of turns, this card takes over the game. If you had 10 mana in your mana pool, you use 3 of it, and then you double the 7 that's remaining to go to 14 for a fairly modest gain. It's not uncommon to be higher than that, though. Let's say you're starting with 20 mana, and then you use 3 of it, you go to 17, and now you have 34 mana for a gain of 14. Not bad. 
The next one that is very special is Mana Reflection. Four green green for an enchantment that says if you tap a permanent for mana, it produces twice as much mana instead. This card is very different from the mana doublers on the previous slide because this says if you tap a permanent, it produces twice as opposed to the other ones which say if you tap a permanent or if you tap a land, it produces an additional mana. When you tap Nykthos for seven mana, it's pretty good. When you tap it with mana reflection out, it's going to produce 14. Compare that to if you had Zendikar Resurgent, instead of tapping for seven, it would tap for eight because it just adds one more mana. Mana Reflection is extremely powerful in this deck, and probably worth the price tag, which unfortunately has been going up quite a bit recently. The last card I want to talk about for Mana Doublers is Silvala, Heart of the Wilds. This is one green green for a 2-3 legendary creature, Elf Scout. It says whenever another creature enters the battlefield, its controller may draw a card if its power is greater than each other creature's power. It also has green, tap. Add X mana in any combination of colors to your mana pool, where X is the greatest power among creatures you control. Omnath is going to have the greatest power among creatures you control, and he, Silvala is going to allow you to add mana to your mana pool equal to Omnath's power every turn, or every time you tap with Silvala. Silvala is so powerful that, honestly, Silvala and Omnath are interchangeable at the commander spot in this deck. The same strategies work with either one, I prefer playing with Omnath because who doesn't want to make an enormous elemental? But Silvala is extremely powerful and well worth getting into your deck. And she provides card draw. As I've said a couple of times, Omnath is very prone to getting hated out of the table. And to counter that, we're going to need some protection spells. So... You are going to want to get political. We've talked a little bit about Pierre's whim and naming your uh, your opponents as friends, if required, to try to maybe curry a little bit of favor. But you are going to have to fight at some point. Your mana is going to make you look strong. There are plenty of games where Omnath will be dead and you won't have anything going on, and your opponents will still be targeting you because they know that you can make such a strong presence in such short time if you're given the opportunity. Instant speed casting saves games, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Omnath can die at instant speed, and all of the mana you've been accumulating through the previous turns will just be gone if that turn or phase or step ends. So you need to protect your mana pool just as much as you need to protect Omnath. So the first card I want to talk about is Bear Umbra. Bear Umbra is two green green for an enchantment aura. You're going to enchant Omnath almost every single time. It says Enchanted Creature gets plus two plus two and halves whenever this creature attacks, untap all lands you control. It also has Totem Armor, meaning that if Omnath would die, instead you're just going to remove the Bear Umbra. Very frequently you're going to put Bear Umbra on Omnath, tap all of your lands to grow Omnath to a pretty good size, attack, and then before damage you're going to tap all of your lands again because of the Bear Umbra trigger, and that's going to make Omnath probably a lethal threat all on its own. The Totem Armor is why this is better than just a mana doubler, but this card is very strong. Asceticism is another enchantment that I really enjoy playing in this deck. It's three green green for an enchantment that says, Creatures you control can't be the targets of spells or abilities your opponents control. It also says one in a green, regenerate target creature. This means your whole team has Hexproof. Not Shroud, Hexproof. And you can regenerate them for just two mana. It turns your whole team kind of into Thruns. So that's pretty sweet. Vigor is a really powerful card that's going to protect you from damage-based removal and pretty much shut down red decks on the spot. It's three green, green, green for a 6-6 six, six elemental incarnation with trample, and if damage would be dealt to another creature you control, prevent that damage, and put a plus one plus one counter on that creature for each one damage prevented this way. It also has, when Vigor is put into a graveyard from anywhere, shuffle it into its owner's library. Vigor doesn't protect himself the same way it protects other creatures, but let's say your opponent wants to Blasphemous Act, Vigor definitely shuts that down. You're going to put 13 plus one plus one counters on all of your other creatures. And Omnath doesn't actually get plus one, plus one counters from the mana. It just has plus one, plus one. So often getting those counters is a good way to make sure Omnath stays sizable, even if you do have to use your mana on something else. 
Heroic Intervention is probably one of my favorite commander cards overall. This is a one in a green instant that just says permanence you control gain hexproof and indestructible until end of turn. It isn't to fairy's protection but it is pretty close it only lasts for one turn but just giving your whole board protection basically from everything means that you are going to survive the board wipe it means you're going to protect your key combo pieces and when i say combo i really just mean make omnath big and kill i don't mean combo in the traditional sense of infinite anythings because this deck is fairly linear in what it wants to do and there are no combos in my version Instant speed recasting is something I mentioned earlier, and this is probably the most important section of the entire deck and making sure that it's running smoothly. These spells allow you to recast Omnath before the mana in your mana pool is gone, before it disappears. So Aloran is the first of these three very key cards. It's two green green for an enchantment with any player may play creature cards with converted mana costs three or less without paying their mana costs and as though they had flash. And really the as though they had flash is the most important bit here. Aloran has a huge advantage and a huge disadvantage compared to the other two options. All three of these cards are going to allow you to play Omnath at instant speed before the phase has ended so that the mana in your mana pool is still safe. Aloran has the advantage of giving you three mana basically per cast because you're allowed to cast Omnath without paying his commander cast or his actual casting cost, but you still need to play the pay the commander tax. So every time you cast Omnath, it's still going to cost two generic mana per time you've cast him from the command zone. And Aloran has another disadvantage in that this ability is symmetrical. If your opponent has great three mana creatures, they're going to flash them in at your end step and make you look kind of silly. So often Aloran is worth playing because having Omnath on the table at all times is so important, but there are definitely games where it can kind of ruin things. The next option is Yeva, Nature's Herald, which is two green green for a 4-4 legendary elf shaman. It has flash and you may cast green creature spells as though they had flash. This is doing the same job as Aloran. You're not getting that three mana discount, but you're not giving that symmetrical ability either. Having green creature spells have flash means that you can cast all of your creatures as though they had flash because you're a mono green deck. But Yeva is very powerful, but she is just a 4-4 creature. So often she can eat a removal spell and then all of a sudden it's back to losing all your mana. And as an enchantment, Aloran is harder to get off the battlefield. The last option is an artifact, the Dalkin Orrery, which is four generic mana for an artifact that says you may cast non-land cards as though they had flash. This card is kind of infamous in Commander, just as being either over or underrated depending on who you are, but in this deck it has a distinct purpose and it's extremely important. You're going to cast Omnath every single time it dies so that you can keep what mana you have in the mana pool. If you're up at 40 mana, you don't really mind spending 9 of it on recasting Omnath, that's a cost that you're very happy to pay, because it means you still have a 32-32, and you're probably still going to win the game. Let's talk about card draw. One of the ways this deck can kind of go wrong is if you don't have enough cards in your hand, but we have a few ways to combat that. We're going to try and draw cards in a few big chunks, and this is a pretty risky play. Some of these spells are pretty prone to removal, and we're going to want to time the casting of them very carefully. The bigger your creature, the more you're going to draw, so you don't want to cast these when you have a couple of mana dorks out. You want to try and save them for when you have a huge Omnath to use. And these spells that I'm going to talk about are not the only ways we're drawing cards. There are also several things that we've already seen, such as Zendikar Resurgent or Selvala, that will draw us cards, but these are some of the ones that are the biggest and kind of flashiest. First, I want to talk about Soul's Majesty, which is not particularly powerful for one important reason. It's four and a green for a sorcery that says draw cards equal to the power of target creature you control. Because this says target creature, and it doesn't just say e draw cards equal to the power of like the highest powered creature you control, 
This is really prone to getting blown out by removal. If your Omnath has 60 power, well, you're going to lose if you draw 60 cards, most likely. But, and they remove your Omnath in response to Soul's Majesty, you're going to draw zero cards, which can feel terrible. So timing this one right is very important. Rishkar's Expertise is very similar, but much safer. It's four green green for a sorcery. It says draw cards equal to the greatest power among creatures you control. And then it says you may cast a card with converted mana cost five or less from your hand without paying its mana cost. All of these Expertise cards have great utility in Commander games, and Rishkar's Expertise is frequently going to draw you seven to 15 cards and then get to cast the best one from among them. This card is very worthwhile, and it does exactly what I was saying I wished Soul's Majesty did. It's saying, instead of target creature, it's just equal to the greatest power among creatures you control. Hunter's Prowess is very similar to these other ones, but it's like the combat version of this effect. It's a four and a green sorcery, five mana, so it says, until end of turn, target creature gets plus three, plus three, and gains trample, and whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, draw that many cards. As I've said, Omnath does not have trample na natively, and getting trample on Omnath is one of the key ways to win the game. So Hunter's Prowess is doing double duty. So it's not the most efficient card, but the fact that it's both huge amounts of card draw and a potential win means it's worth playing. Greater Good is an enchantment, two green green, it says, sack a creature, draw cards equal to the sacrificed creature's power, then discard three cards. Momentous Fall is an instant that's also two green green, and it says, as an additional cost to cast this spell, sacrifice a creature. You draw cards equal to the sacrificed creature's power, then you gain life equal to its toughness. The reason these two cards are very important in this deck is sometimes Omnath is going to die. Despite our protection spells, despite all the things we're doing to try to protect it, it's just going to happen. Greater Good and Momentous Fall are ways to take that horrible moment of losing all your mana and at least get some good card draw from it and gain some life if you're casting Momentous Fall. It's always better to Momentous Fall or Greater Good Omnath when it's super huge then just let it die and let all of that mana go to waste. And if you have Aloran or Videlkin Orori or Yeva out, you're going to recast Omnath anyway. So often this is just a momentary second where you're not having your commander because Omnath always returns. Speaking of returning, let's talk about the recursive spells in this deck and why they are so important. The first one we're going to discuss is Eternal Witness. This is kind of the most bread and butter of these cards. People play a ton of Eternal Witnesses. I think it's better here because of Devotion. Getting two green pips means that your Nykthos is a pretty big fan of Eternal Witness compared to something like Regrowth. And sometimes you just really need to get back your Aloran or you really need to get back your Mana Reflection. This is a great way to do it. Green Warden of Marasa is 4 green green for a 5-4 elemental creature, and when Green Warden enters or dies, you can return a card from your graveyard to your hand. This is kind of the middle version of this effect, and getting back two cards is extremely powerful, but not quite as powerful as Praetor's Council. 5 green 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 for a sorcery, a very flashy sorcery that says, return all cards from your graveyard to your hand, exile Praetor's Council, you have no maximum hand size for the rest of the game. This is never going to resolve, and that's okay, it's so worthwhile, and if your opponents are caught off guard and don't have a counterspell for it, you're pretty much going to win on the spot. The fact that you've been hoarding your mana for the last 10 turns means that when Praetor's Council comes down, you have access to everything. You're going to be pretty happy to cast four enormous creatures and another draw spell and whatever else you need, and it pretty much wins the game on its own. Finishers and Payoffs is kind of my favorite part about Omnath as a commander and as a deck. The really cool thing about Omnath is it, Omnath is a finisher on its own, and it also is an enabler for other finishers. So in that way, it's extremely flexible. You're going to be able to play pretty much any big creatures you want. Omnath's getting that plus one, plus one anyway, so very frequently what you're doing is you're shrinking Omnath to make some other threat. 
pretty often the correct play is just to keep Omnath big, but it's also fun to play some big stuff. So you can go wide or you can go tall with this style of deck. Omnath itself can get extremely large and just win the game, or you can play some token producing cards and make many wolves or ants, and we'll see what that looks like. I have played tons of different types of payoffs in this deck, and I will rotate them out just for fun. There are cards that have been performing pretty well, and I'll take them out just because I want to try something different. Let's say you want to play Copperhoof Vorak. This card is not very good, but it is very silly. It's three green green for a 2-2, two -two, and it says Copperhoof Vorak gets plus one plus one for each untapped permanent your opponents control. If you're playing this card, you just want to mess with your opponents and make them have to count their untapped permanents and tap their lands at awkward times to shrink it. It's a logistical nightmare, but sometimes it's fun to hit them with a huge beast. Or you could play It That Betrays and start killing them with their own stuff as they sacrifice it. You could play Wolfbriar Elemental and make 50 wolves and kill them with tutus. Or Ant Queen, and the advantage here is you can use Ant Queen's ability to make 1-1 insects at your opponent's end step, so you don't have to commit like you do for Wolfbriar. Galta, one of my favorite ways to win a game. If you can't answer this 12-12 trampling giant dinosaur, I'm going to win. Genesis Wave. If you want a Genesis Wave for 28 cards, you're going to have a good time with this deck. Kamal, Fist of Krosa says I can pay a green to make them to make a creature and I can pay five to overrun so you're gonna just win games by having Kamal and enough mana open. Artisan of Kozilek, why stop with one big creature when you can just get back some more by recurring them? Or if you're just truly a terrible person, you can play Triumph of the Hordes and get a few tokens out and win with Infect. I don't recommend it if you have friends you want to keep, but it is always an option. Now one thing I do want to talk about is this deck has many, many good cards, and there are always new cards coming out that are that fit in pretty well. The Great Henge is one that I just don't have a copy of. This is a great fit for this deck. It's going to be two mana most of the time, but it is seven green green. It says it costs X less, where X is the greatest power among creatures you control. You can tap it for green green and two life. And whenever a non-token non creature enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus one, plus one counter on it and draw a card. So this would fit in beautifully with our other card draw options, and it's very often going to be adding two green mana per turn cycle. Nissa Who Shakes the World is another amazing addition. It's three green green for a five loyalty Nissa Planeswalker. It's got a passive ability. Whenever you tap a forest for mana, add an additional green mana. And then the plus one is to put three plus one plus one counters on up to one non target non-creature land you control. Untap it, and it becomes a zero zero elemental creature with vigilance and haste that's still a land. So you're going to be tapping all of your forests for double mana, and you're going to be turning them into threats. You can also pay excuse me, minus eight for get an emblem with lands you control, have indestructible, search your library for any number of forest cards, put them onto the battlefield tapped, and shuffle your library. In this deck there are 30, 30 forests, so that's a pretty good amount of mana. Problem with Nyssa is, after a board wipe, you're losing your lands, so it hurts extra badly. Nyx Bloom Ancient has everything I love about mana reflection, but it's times three instead of times two. This is a seven mana, four green, green, green for a five, five elemental creature with trample. And if you tap a permanent for mana, it produces three times as much of that mana instead. This card is insane with Selvala or Nykthos or any of the other cards that produces a lot of mana at once. And this plus mana reflection, whoo that's a lot of mana. Thank you for watching. Uh, this is my first of these deck techs. This is a deck that I own and love and play all the time. Check out the full list. There's a link down below. And in the comments, what would you include? What would you take out? What cards am I so stupid for not playing? And maybe did you get a good idea from any of this? And on a completely other note, this is my first video. How could I improve? What would you offer me as tips or constructive crit criticism? because, well, I'm just human, and we're all starting out somewhere. So help me out, and I'll see you for the next Deck Tech. This is Goofy Word. I hope you learned something. Have a great day.